Hello, <laughs> I'm Carrie Just and I'm talking to you with my Pearl of Wisdom, which I would have liked to have done a demonstration, but we're in lockdown and so it's not possible because I would have to be demonstrating on my cats and I don't think they'd be terribly pleased. So, so what I'm going to do is talk a bit about one of the hows of working with people. And so for those of you who are not kinesiologists, this is really how we as practitioners will approach you when we're working with you. We, what we do is witness who you are. We get to know you. We listen deeply and totally and with understanding that you are a unique being in every part of you. So what we're doing is listening to your story. And when a new client comes to see me, then the thing that I really love to do is get to, get to know them. So I sit and listen and <clears throat> listen actively. So I might ask a question or two. And then I begin to feel into your story. I hope that doesn't sound creepy. Uh, but what, what I mean is that it's like I'm using my felt sense my feelings to feel what is also happening with you so I can walk alongside you um, because I can't get lost in your story because if if so if you're lost in your story I'd get lost too but if I'm alongside you then I can walk with you and listen to what has happened to you what is happening to you what you're feeling in the way of symptoms, problems, difficulties, and we can together begin to unfold the, the depth of the story that's relevant to what you've brought to see me, why, why you've come to see me. Because in fact, <clears throat> you, you will have taken a huge step of courage to come to see me in the first place. It's, it's enormously courageous to ask for help, and I don't just mean in terms of going to a practitioner, that's really courageous. But sometimes we find it really hard to ask for help, even in the smallest ways, like, you know, I need a hug. Um, I'd like you to just, I'd like to talk to you for five minutes, that kind of thing. And we're, we're needing to really um, grapple with that, I think, in these times, because we, we're, we're much more alone in these times of lockdown and in terms of the illnesses that are around us. None of us want to get COVID. It's nasty business. And <clears throat> so we're having to keep ourselves separate in a way that we don't normally have to do. Um, so I felt that this was quite an important thing to be talking about in terms of um, pearls of wisdom. Now, if you're a kinesiologist, I expect you already do listen to your clients, listen actively, deeply, um, and use the kinesiology tool that we all have, the, the way of muscle testing, which helps us to uncover the depths of the story. So if I just talk about what happened to me recently, in the summer, I. I was quite ill. I had, um, I didn't really realise I was ill, but I had vomiting over about a month, about every three or four days, and went to the doctor. Um, they investigated all kinds of things inside me, didn't find anything at all, which was very reassuring. So then, by chance, my daughter mentioned something called histamine intolerance, which I'd never heard of. And it's a rather complicated kind of um, allergy, stroke sensitivity, stroke intolerance um, to food, which is something I'd, I'd never heard of it ever. Um, I've heard of antihistamines, um, which people take when they have hay fever and that kind of thing. So it's connected with an allergic reaction. But um, what I've been able to do is really witness my body in this, is to go deeply into the times when I feel nauseous, when I feel um, 
shaky inside when I feel that um, that food I really don't want to eat. And what I've discovered is that my kind of love-hate relationship with tomatoes is real. They're full of histamine. My love-hate relationship with avocados is the same. They're full of histamine. And so is tea. I went off drinking tea. I've loved tea and I would love a cup of tea, but apparently tea is fermented. So fermented foods also contain a lot of histamine. But what I'm, the point I'm trying to get over to you is that the um, that there's something about being able to witness our own body with what's happening to it at this kind of level of um, food, um, the sensations that are happening in the digestive area, which has always been my problem area in my life. Um, and I, then I transpose that into working with clients because I, I absolutely love working with people and I really, I'm really interested in people and what's happening with them. So really witnessing what's happening is um, a complete joy, really. So let me see, what have I got here? I've got some notes here because I think that's, I'm reaching the limit of my um, being able to just speak. <laughs> so what I think happens when when we're witnessed, I think it's that wonderful feeling we have when we've met someone who is just totally with us. It, I don't know, it's a quality. It's, it's not a set of happenings, but the quality that comes over means that I feel totally accepted. Doesn't matter what I say. Whatever I say is okay. Um, this person is with me, so somebody who's with me is a valuable asset in my life, really valuable. And um, yes, I think that's what I want to say to begin with. So I'd love your questions, Phil and Bettina, <laughs> to help me into the next bit. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so have you got anything, Bettina? Well, not really a question. It, it all it makes does. sense. It, 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 I mean, um, I, I, what you what you said is 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 brilliant. It's it's just lovely to to hear you you say that. I didn't feel I needed to interject in in any way that wouldn't have been uh, obtrusive or intrusive. It, yeah, like we said before, we discussed this um, before we recorded this. Um, somebody um, could have a, a minor issue, you know, anything, um, and it just doesn't go away and they keep talking about it. And, and then they feel like they become mm -hmm. a nuisance to others because people get bored about listening to them. And then it's not about the issue anymore. It's, but it's about the feeling of, yeah, not being heard. And then your energy is kind of, I don't know, disrupted because you keep thinking about yourself differently and if you just have somebody to listen then that energy can flow again and and the body can focus on the actual um issue you know that was that is still yeah, there yeah that, that makes perfect sense because then that inability to express what you need to say then becomes another facet of the problem it becomes you know a, a bolt on so it becomes another thing that's causing stress on the energy system absolutely yeah i mean i came across the the word witnessing when i read years ago when i was doing my psychotherapy training a book by alice miller the drama of being a child and she talked she was a psychotherapist child psychotherapist and she wrote about the way we can lock away our experiences so we keep hidden and keep our experiences hidden because it's not safe. Mm. And quite odd, this relates to what you've just been saying, I think, Bettina, that, you know, we have to feel safe. And so if we keep our true self and our experiences hidden, then we're keeping our whole self away somehow. And being able to bring our whole self forward is 
the gift we are in the world, mm. each and every single one of us. And I think that's so important. Um, what, what Alice Miller said was that she felt that when a person is fully witnessed, they become, they become the person that they really are. They allow their true self to be seen. And with that comes, oh my goodness, maybe I could do this. Maybe I could do that. Maybe that's possible. And this then links me back in. I've, I've got a bit of a butterfly self going on, but it links me into the work of Bruce Lipton. I don't know if you've come across him. Oh, yes. Um, yeah. <laughs> Biology of belief, man. Well, he talks about our DNA being a bundle of possibility. And so if our DNA, the centre of every single cell in our body, is a possibility, what's going to bring our true possibility out? Apparently, it's the environment we're in. Yeah. So if we're going to be truly ourselves, expanding into this person we are and can be, then the environment needs to be right. Um, so these were his biological findings. And I love it because this is really what we do as kinesiologists. We create the environment where the person can be their true self and then their DNA goes, aha, I can now be the possibility that's there. And I've seen this so often with clients, you know, they come, bowed down with some ghastly symptom or some old trauma that they're working through. And once they, we've found the story through muscle testing, through listening, through witnessing, through being alongside, then suddenly there's something that happens and the person can step into a new way of being. Now this excites me. It really excites me in the work I do. And I love that. That's brilliant. Yeah, it's definitely, you know, it's always important. But I think, like you said, you know, in, in times like these where we can't meet up and we can't do the proper muscle testing, maybe a phone call with the client is is what they need at the moment. And it, it would help them a lot. Um, and just listen, just listen to what they're going through and I've, um, it's, it's not really called anything like witnessing, but I've read um, in, in um, linked to parenting, I've read the book uh, by uh, Philippa Perry, the book, yeah. You Wish Your Parents, I've yeah. read. And it's all about, you know, when your child has a tantrum, instead of just going and saying, oh, you know, be quiet now, or, you know, distract them with anything, just go to their level and say, I understand mm. what you're going through. I can hear you. I can see you're very upset about this. It doesn't mean they get what they what they want, you know, when they have the tantrum, but it means they feel that you're with them there. That and it probably goes into witnessing. You're witnessing their distress. Absolutely. Whether you think that's exaggerated mm. or it doesn't matter. It's it's taking what they're feeling and meeting them there and that's all they need sometimes and then they calm down and then they can move on and they can say I'm, I'm in a safe place I'm being listened to I can explore other things now yeah, yeah. I, I think it's really important um that as human beings you know we're designed to express ourselves and we're you know we need to we, we sort of need that interaction with other people you know it's why solitary confinement is such a punishment because you know it, it, it's it's being heard is so so important you know um just you know i'm a huge fan of, of externalizing our thoughts whether we do it through journaling or letter writing or speaking um but uh, a friend of mine she she wrote to me recently and she was just telling me about her family and she said you know just by writing it down in a letter and knowing that I would read it made her feel so much better and she said if she'd written it in a journal and no one was going to read it it would have had a different energy about it and I think it is about that it's just knowing that some other person has 
acknowledged and interacted with with what it is that we're going through um, can just be a, a, again that huge release of energy you know stagnant energy that's not going anywhere is not going to do us any favors yes i agree completely thank you both that's really great contributions to what i'm trying to say <laughs> or what i am saying i shouldn't say trying yes. i shouldn't i shouldn't say shouldn't anyway that's <laughs> <laughs> These are all the, the kind of linguistic things we get tied up in, aren't they? Anyway. <laughs> well, the, the only other thing I think I'd like to add is that I have, I have witnessed so many people um, who, as we've gone into their story and discovered what's behind the symptoms, the difficulties, the problems, because there's, there's usually a backstory. And it's, you know, it's not just that their shoulder hurts. There's something, something's gone on before that's contributed to the um, shoulder that's hurting or the indigestion or the migraines or whatever. And I think it's, in order to get to that, it's incredibly important to create a totally safe space and listening is I think the key, listening and witnessing is the key to doing that, to say I'm, I'm totally with you. So I think that's just what I'd like to um, finish on, really. That Thank means. you, Carrie. that's been amazing. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for being there and listening to me. <laughs> it was a pleasure to listen to you all day. <laughs> So we're just coming back to Carrie Joss for her witnessing. Um, unfortunately, I had a few questions after the last recording, so we thought we stage it again. <laughs> Come back together and um, I thought these might be good questions for our members to hear Carrie's take on it as well and, and these things. So welcome back, Carrie and uh, Bill. <laughs> <laughs> So the first question, it might be one or two, is um, what, your, what your thoughts are if, if a client is maybe not so forthcoming with information um, in the initial consultation or probably mainly the first stage of the consultation, the first session or any, any consequence sessions, you know, what, how can we get more out of them? And then link to that, does it actually matter if we don't get too much out of them? So what's well, it it's an interesting question, Bettina, because it's um, all the way through my lengthy career, more than 30 years now of working with clients, I have met people who <clears throat> really don't want to talk. And that's fair enough. Some people don't. They're just not talkers. <clears throat> and I've had, I've had clients come and, and I've said, well, you know, why have you come and what's it about and what would you like out of the session and that kind of thing and quite a number of people in the past have said um, just do what you do I'm just going to lie here and please just do what you do because I've heard it's very good <clears throat> you know and that's fine you know if, if that's what they want from a session that's fine and so in a sense, it's like the customer is always right. You know, well, however they want to deal with this, <clears throat> that's perfectly okay. But I think if, if, um, if you're interested in what people say, then like I am, then I, I attempt to create a listening space so that when they come into the space, they know that I'm really interested in them that I'm fascinated by what they're going to say, that I really want to hear it, that every single bit is like a little pearl, we're talking about pearls, but like a, 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 a gift to me. <clears throat> so that, that's my listening space that I attempt to create. Um, and so I think if, if we can remember that the clients are experts on themselves, so everything they say is relevant. I think that helps to create the space anyway. Um, so what do I do? I, I ask people, what can I help you with? Um, how would you like to feel at the end of the session? How would life be if your 
pain went, your symptom went, your difficulty got alleviated, you know, how would life be? And there's something about talking around that that I feel is really, really important because it gives people a chance to look at the positive that can come out of the session for them. And we know from John Thee and many other people who've spoken about it that having a positive input into the session actually really helps the session to have the positive result that we're all looking for. <clears throat> so um, I, th I think that there's been um, evidence from um, a guy called Eugene Gendlin, who wrote a book called Focusing, brilliant book, where he talks about how research was done into why a lot of the talking therapies don't actually work very well or don't have long-term lasting effects. And what was found was that the talking therapies don't always encourage people to have a feeling felt response to the work they're doing. So if, if you're working just in your head and talking, then it doesn't filter down from here and it has to filter down all the way to the, your toes and maybe beyond into your earth connections beneath. But, the, but there's something about the embodying of the work that's being done and the embodying of the, the whole process on a feeling level, whatever that feeling level is for you, that is incredibly important. <clears throat> So he, he developed this way of talking about the felt sense, which is a way of <clears throat> um, kind of using body sensation to understand what's happening in ourselves. He suggested that the best way to get a good result from our work that we're doing with clients, you know, both for both of us, is to use the felt sense. So for the client, this means saying, so when we did that technique, could you feel anything? Did anything change? Did you notice anything? So feeling can be quite a challenging word to use for some people, but noticing, that's fairly neutral. Um, did you notice what was going on for you? That's quite neutral. So it's finding the language that the person can relate to, <clears throat> because then, it's like we can encourage them to build up their own felt sense of what is happening to them, <clears throat> either with their difficulty, their symptom, or when things begin to change. So I always check out, um, how did that seem to you when we just did that technique? Um, did you notice anything? What did you notice? And again, be really fascinated by the, by the answer because this is where the change will happen, when the person actually kind of clocks that actually something has happened, something is changing. My goodness, I felt something go all the way down to my toes. Oh, I felt something in my back. <clears throat> and what we're looking for is change all the time. So in the looking for change, then, if we can encourage the person to also look for change, they won't get so stuck in what it was they came to you with in the first place. Does yeah. that make sense? Yeah, that's that's fascinating. I think so. I've had a I've had a few clients who, because I'm very much into that as well. You know, when when they're going through a technique or thinking something, it's like really be aware of how you feel in your body when you're thinking that, because quite often it's something that. That we're trying to release it's something that's trapped in there that needs to come out and i've had a few people who have you know nearly got off the couch and left and it's like just stay there it's just a feeling it will pass and you know we always feel better when when that feeling has been regulated or corrected or or has passed through or whatever it needs to do so it's fascinating hearing you sort of speak in in, in a similar way to the experiences i've had Yes, and I think <clears throat> I think the feeling, the felt sense idea or the inner feeling that we may have, it could be a, a sensation, it could be an emotion, it could be a, um, a sudden aha moment, 
whatever it is for that person is really valuable. Um, so encouraging that is great. And one of the things I would encourage every therapist practitioner to do is to note their own feelings. So how do I feel before I've seen this client? Okay, I feel like this. Yes, I might have a little scratchy throat like I've got at the moment. But if when I work with the client, the scratchy throat is still there, but I suddenly feel nauseous or suddenly feel pain somewhere or suddenly get a terrible sense of doom, I know it's not mine. Yeah. Now, this is valuable information. And although it's not appropriate to load it on the client, it's worth noting because it means you've stumbled across another layer of information for the for the client and at some point it might be appropriate to say gosh when you said that I suddenly felt terribly sad does this mean anything to you yeah. and quite often the client will say oh yes yes it does um, that reminds me of da di da di da so you're really journeying with them on that felt level that body sensation level and I think it's one of the things we can really help with in this Western society we live in, because we're so encouraged to work from our heads. You know, our academic training, our schooling, uh, everything is kind of happens up here. Whereas, in fact, it's a tiny bit of who we are. Think of the trillions and trillions of cells in the rest of the body who are all just as intelligent as what goes in up here what goes on in up here so it's, um I, th I think that this is really what i want to get over with your brilliant question bettina so thank you for that is there anything else well thank you um i was just thinking yeah of, of something else but it, it adds to that i think um you know when you for example i've had a client who was sent by his wife so his wife was my client and she thought oh he could do with it as well or you know you come across at somebody at a fair or an exhibition when we were able to do them um said so, you know you, you get them in and and they're kind of skeptical um it probably goes in the same direction but yeah my feeling was kind of i did say to them well if you if you're not ready you know if you don't want to come then maybe i'm not the the one to help you but is there any thoughts from you about people like that well I, I mean i've done in my time i've met many people at fairs and talks I used to love giving talks, absolutely loved it <clears throat> in the olden days. Um, and what, what I always found was that people would come and they'd kind of look half sideways at a, at a fair, for instance. And they'd kind of look. But what I found was that if I was enthusiastic about what I was doing and approached them with my enthusiasm and invited them to come and just have a go, just see what you think, and I'd be really interested to hear what you think. Mostly people would. They'd, they'd actually have a go and see what happened when their muscle was tested. Um, in the early days, people were terribly interested in food allergies. So, <clears throat> so that was quite a good way in to, to meet people. And it's such a small amount of what we do, actually. I mean, it's it's one thing, but only one strand. But it is a way of encouraging people in because people are interested in food. We all have to be, we have to eat. And food is one of those things I think that can really help to encourage people to have a look at what else might be going on. Does that answer your question, Bettina? Brilliant, yeah, thank you. Is there anything? I think, I think what you were saying as well, Bettina, about, you know, if, if you're not ready to have this work, then yeah. maybe I'm not the practitioner for you or the timing's just not right. Because at the end of the day, it's like, uh, you know, they're not coming to see you for your sake. They're coming to see you for their sake. And, and it has to be it has to be their decision. You know, it's like 
you know, a wife sending husband is a, is a, is a classic example, you know, and the husband comes sort of stomping in because they don't really want to be there. And it's like, at the end of the day, it's like, it's not my job to convince you that this is going to work. It's like, you've, you've come under your own steam and, uh, you know, it, it, it's for you to, to try it, to experience it. And, and you can decide whether you think it's, it's worth your while. Um, you know, or whether just coming for one session and telling your wife you've been and it's rubbish, you know, but, um, you know, I, I was that husband, <laughs> you know, I, I was sent to a kinesiologist by my wife and, uh, and the rest is history. So <laughs> well, I like that. That's great, Phil. You were that husband. I was. I was sceptical. I thought it was going to be a waste of money, a waste of time, but I was desperate. So, um, you know, <laughs> a lot of our clients are desperate when they when they come. Um, sadly, where where the, the person they 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 seem to come to when they've tried everything else. And I'd love them to be, uh, you know, love for us to be the first person that people come to um, when when something's going on. Yeah, that specific client. Um, I mean, he only came for one session, but. Uh... <laughs> But it was it was the pressure when he said, does this work even if I don't believe in it, you know, and then that got me into a frenzy like, oh, my God, the pressure. The thing on. with that is, um, though, it's like, know. you know, it's not your job to convince him. And, uh, you know, when I've been in that situation, especially when you start, and you think, oh, my God, this person doesn't believe what I'm doing. It's like, actually, who am I trying to convince? Am I trying to convince myself that this works? And it's like, I know this works. And it just it just sends, sets you working from a different platform. Um, you know, I, I, I don't see my role as being one of convincing people that it works. It's like it's your choice whether this works or not. I know it works. You know, it's for you to decide whether it works for you. Yes, on the whole, I think if you if you know it works and if you can be enthusiastic about what you're offering, mm. people on the whole will give it a go. Yes. And they might or might not like it, but that's their choice in the end. Yeah, absolutely. So it's coming down, yeah, again, to your own mm. belief, trust, yeah. confidence. Yeah, absolutely. You know, it's like so, you became a practitioner because you felt the benefit and you know that it's a valuable resource. And that doesn't mean that everybody else out there is going to think it's a valuable resource. And that's absolutely fine. You know, my, my mindset is there are people out there who know it works, who do benefit from it, and they're the people I'm interested in. And if somebody comes along skeptically, not really knowing whether it's gonna work or not, and they get a good result, then, then brilliant. But, uh, you know, when, when I first started, um, again, I came from this really grounded, skeptical place. So I was thinking, you know, I'm gonna work with people who maybe wouldn't normally buy into this, and they'll be so amazed by it that they'll go and tell their friends, and their friends will go, well, if, if so-and-so thinks it's good, it must be good. And it's like my first clients were so earthy. You know, I had a pork farmer, a plumber, uh, you know, it was th these blokes coming and they told nobody about what I did because they were so <laughs> embarrassed. They all got changes. But I'm thinking, where's this word of mouth? And it's like, no, because men don't talk to their friends about the therapies they're having. Um, so, you know, I was making a lot of work for myself. Um, <laughs> try to spread the word that way <laughs> they might they might mention something or I don't know but yeah it goes back to what you said about the mentoring isn't it when um, when you've got a problem mm. with a client or if you feel like you're not you know I don't know confident enough to just do your protocol as it comes up on the muscle testing then go and see a mentor and or your mentor ideally one person that you're yeah. working with mm. for the for a duration of time yes makes a huge difference huge difference that's right because as as practitioners we're working on ourselves all the time as well yeah. you know as as we progress with our clients we're going to be challenged more and more because we're becoming more experienced and we're opening up our our, our field to to more people so inevitably we're going to be finding our comfort zone challenged so yeah I, I think I said before that I'm a, a big fan of mentoring yeah good good I like to hear that <laughs> brilliant that's the questions from me so if there's no further questions from Phil I'll probably think of some more in the next few <laughs> <laughs> we could just go on to this now <laughs> 
Thank you so, so much for taking that extra time for us, Carrie well, and Phil. Yes. Um, well, thank you. Thank you for coming up with the questions and thank you for being there. Brilliant. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank See you soon. Yeah. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.